A warning before we begin. This podcast is explicit in every way. And this episode mentions suicidal thoughts. I was over at a friend's house and she was always having kind of like house parties. And at one of her house parties, she had music video after music video of Rico Nasty just playing. I know for a fact that one of the music videos was Snack a Bitch. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. The music video opens with Rico alone in a low-lit hallway. Chunky black boots, smeared eyeliner, and Rico's expression? That smirk of defiance over screaming guitar chords. I don't need your opinion. Do what I fucking want. It makes it hard to look away. And I just sat there in awe. Mm, And when was this? Like, how old were you? Like 16 or 17. Rodney, we've all had those moments in adolescence, right? Where you hear a song and it just sticks with you forever. It speaks to you. Are you talking about that song that, like, shapes your soul for the rest of your life? (laughs) Exactly. You know the one. Like, for me... I can definitely recite all the lyrics to Nicki Minaj's Itty Bitty Piggy or even her monster verse with the same type of mm, as if I'm riding around campus with my girls. Oh, wait, see, I'm thinking Bonita Applebaum, Tribe Called Quest or something like that. Ooh, okay, I like it. <laughs> well, for Talile Jaro, a recent college grad living in Portland, that song was Rico Nasty's Smack a Bitch. I'd never heard music like this from someone who looked like me, so I was very, like, enthralled in her music with the very first time I saw it. The magic of Smagovich is pretty undeniable. That simultaneous restraint and warning shot in her lyrics, mm, it's low-key Rico's calling card. Just as much rap as it is punk. I felt empowerment. Her voice, just in general, like, screaming the song, like, it just awoken something in me to just feel comfortable and it's okay to be like angry she kind of made me feel more comfortable in myself you can't even handle a bitch like me make my own money and i buy my own weed touch my wrist and your hand gonna freeze begging for the kitty on his hands and knees who you fighting on come on girl i know you the message and sound of rico's music resonates so deep and it's so important for black girls to hear because in a world that paints you showing any emotion as you being too much too loud, too difficult, too ratchet. Rico's telling us to lean into those things. Channel that anger instead of muting it. And Talile wanted to be a part of it in real life. When I saw that Rico Nasty is going on tour, I was so excited. Like, this is like the first time I'm ever going to be able to see her. Like, I'm, I was just so pumped. I was like, I have to buy these tickets. Like, I'm going. In 2021, Rico went on tour with Playboy Cardi. It was a huge look. It was supposed to be a triumphant moment for her career and her fans. Their biggest chance to all rage together. But that moment was taken from them. So get it off your chest. I'm Sydney Madden. I'm Rodney Carmichael. And from NPR Music, This is Louder Than a Riot. Where we confront the double standard that's become the standard. On every episode this season, we tackle one unwritten rule of hip hop that affects the most marginalized among us and holds the entire culture back. And one that a new generation of rap refuses to stand for. When the outlet for your anger gets shut down, how do you get it back? Rico Nasty keeps it real about the tour that went left. I don't care if you know I'm a fighter, if you're the toughest bitch in the world. It's about standing up for yourself. It's about remaining powerful throughout the draining. On this episode, rule number eight. What doesn't kill you makes you a strong black woman. Hey, y'all, before we get started, we need to acknowledge something. Since we reported out this story, Playboy Cardi was arrested on assault charges related to domestic violence. The case has been dismissed, but because this all happened after we wrapped our reporting, you aren't going to hear us talking about it in this episode. All right, let's get into it. First, let's start with where we're at right now. Right now, we are at one of my favorite studios. 
and I am here with you. This is really like in the cut studio. It's at the bottom of a hotel and stuff. Yeah, I used to stand. Sid, I know you spent a lot of time with Rico Nasty over the last year talking about everything that went down on this Playboy Cardi tour. Yeah, I did. We linked up a couple times to talk about it. In L.A., we met at this moody underground studio in West Hollywood. They had candles burning everywhere and black and purple decor. Mm, very Rico. Mm-hmm. I think I did my longest session in here was like 18 hours or something. Jesus. I like long sessions. Okay. And every time we talked, she stayed hyping up her fans. She calls them Nasty Mob. They get to come to the show and... They get in a mosh pit, and these little girls that normally are hella timid and shy, they get in a mosh pit, and niggas are like, oh, shit, this bitch is crazy. It's a power. It's like, we are going to infiltrate the male pit, and we will make these niggas die. Like, they are yeah. crazy. Hella powerful. Hella powerful. They're not scared. They've dubbed themselves Nasty Mob because they mob out for Rico and for each other. Online and in real life. You can see it in the pits. Her fans go hard. And they aren't just there for themselves. They want everyone around them to have a good time. I've seen so many mosh pits where it's like a big-ass six-foot nigga just passed out. And the girls are like, please, gently, don't drop him. Security. They're, they're so sweet to one another. That energy of Rico shows, it makes him stand out. My sis, you know what I'm like, quit. I love you. I love you. We waiting in this hot 99 degree sun, but we gonna see. So we talk for me. This seems real. It seems like you really do. I do. I really do. So when Playboy Cardi's team was looking to make the show lineup for his tour, Rico was a natural choice. He's like, uh, she rock her shows. Don't no bitch rock a show like me. And I'll die beside that. Nobody rock shows like me. And he saw that. Like, he respected me. And it was respecting. Rico was excited to get this look from Cardi. She'd always wanted a cross-country tour. Plus, it was a bag. So, of course, she said yes. She started off the tour vlogging the whole experience. It's no bitches. It's gonna be niggas. So you can't play pop. In her first vlog, she's on stage in Nashville doing sound check. You gotta be quicker than that, bitch! Rico was feeling it. She was having fun. Joking around on her very first tour bus and getting to meet a ton of fans across the country. It's a dream to meet you. I just want to say I'm such a big fan of What's your name? Wait, what's your name? Tamala. Tamala and Rico Nancy. Yes, I need some girls and we got them for my last one. After a year inside, Nasty Mob showing up and showing out for Rico, it was really energizing to her. But each night looking out at the crowds, it was becoming obvious how different her fans were from Cardi's. I'm just trying to think of how to square those things. Like, he handpicked you because he knew your, you rage at your show, same as him. Theoretically, there would be like an overlap maybe in the fan base. Yeah, but that's the thing though. Like, I think my fans are too black. <laughs> that was the thing. We was talking about this shit on tour. Like, yeah, like Cardi fans are, it was a lot of white boys, I'm not gonna lie, but they still, it was still black people. Let's be for real. Rage or not, it's a rap concert. So uh, our whole thing was like, <laughs> our shit is for the niggas that's not passing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like for the niggas, <laughs> like, you black. <laughs> You're not getting around this. That's what my fan base is. And then his fan base is more like, uh, I get pulled over by the cops. They're not really gonna think I'm black. <laughs> <laughs> so even though Rico peeped it, it wasn't anything serious. I mean, they went from Nashville to Oklahoma City to Phoenix, 15 shows, and things were going smooth. But then, a month in, something shifted. They got to LA to play at the Forum in Inglewood. When Rico took the stage for her opening set, the crowd seemed restless, disinterested. People were talking over her, and those combos got louder, then rowdier. Then they started to boo her. So did everything happening feel antagonistic? It felt like, yeah, like she's a black girl. We don't want her up here. She not shaking ass, bro. Straight like that. If she not shaking ass, we do not want to see this shit. But that's what you go to the strip club for, not a rap show. So have some cooth. 
Rico felt like she had to respond, so after the show, she started tweeting. We got one of our friends to read out her tweets. Y'all mother should have swallowed you little pissy frogs. Yeah, I said it. Not deleting shit. Try me again. I fly off the stage and possess you. Anti-black ass crowd, weak ass little boys with blonde pubes. Ugh, get me out of here. I think what happened was I disrespected his fans. Plain and simple. All right, hold up. We spent a lot of time talking about Rico fans, but we need to talk about Cardi fans. And as a hip-hop journalist, I know his music, but his fandom is kind of foreign to me. I'm not the one to tell you about it. But luckily, we have someone on our team who can. What's up, Mano? What's up, Sid? Tell the people who you are. So I'm Manos on the Racing. I'm a producer on Louder Than a Riot, and I run a music blog called No Bells. We basically cover a bunch of the the internet slash Zuma rap uh, artists like Yeet, Ken Carson, and of course, Playboy Cardi, the one who kind of started it all. Mm, okay. So as our resident expert on all this, if you can, give me it in two sentences. How would you describe a Playboy Cardi fan? Two sentences. Wow. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I feel like, okay, there's a lot to unpack here because I think it starts with a fan base in Atlanta. His fan base back then was just Atlanta rap fans, kind of in that alt scene. But it really morphed into something a lot more unwieldy, especially as he sort of reached more of this hype beast status. Now the image that just pops in my head is, is toxic white dude, honestly, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> nah, but tell me that story though. Cardi fans are just, they're just different, honestly. And we're not, we're not talking about all Cardi fans, right? But like, there is definitely this contingent of them that really deified him. They really go crazy online and, you know, sometimes even trolling people on the internet. Mm. Yeah, but it seems like Cardi's fan base compared to other rabid fan bases, their actions take on this very purposefully destructive quality. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Sometimes even destructive to Cardi's own career. Cardi fans, and I'm talking about a contingent of them, not all of them, they have leaked Cardi's music many, many times. There's a whole album's worth of material that we'll probably never see the light of day for this reason. And sometimes they can get really destructive with other people online as well. Yeah, and in real life. For sure. Yeah. It can sometimes feel like what Cardi represents is, is counterculture, but when his fan base is so sort of mainstream and so center, it feels a lot more like rebellion for rebellion's sake. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, Mano. Thanks, Sid. So that difference that Mano just laid out is what Rico was confronted with on tour. With those tweets, Rico agitated his fans. And some of them started trolling her online hard. Cardi let her know how they could be. He's like, bro, they're crazy, bro. I'm telling you, don't argue with them. Cardi, he's like, literally, don't argue with them. They're fucking nuts. Like, they, like, invade my privacy all the time. Just don't even pay attention to that shit. Rico tried to take Cardi's advice and ignore them, which made Cardi's fans go even harder. Three nights later at the next show in San Diego, they booed her again. Her DJ kept dropping bombs and her artist tag to offset the Cardi chants. After Rico left the stage, the lights went dark and Cardi came out, bouncing around almost like a little puppet vampire. He didn't say a word, and the show went on like nothing happened. A couple of TikToks of Rico getting booed that night went viral. One video got millions of views and tens of thousands of comments. Some media outlets aggregated those social posts, but the coverage didn't go much deeper than that. This tour was not going how Rico had dreamed. 
Doja and Flo Millie were texting me throughout the whole tour every week. You good? You good? You good? You good? You good? You, good? you okay? I love you. You need a hug? Sending me funny shit. It was very horrible to see. Like, it really broke my heart, you know, because um, I really do love Rico. And to see somebody you love, like, get mistreated like that, it was just the disrespect was just on another level. After seeing those videos, Flo Millie knew she would need some support. And I just felt the need to reach out to her, like, because I didn't like what I was seeing on the Internet. And we had a long talk about it. This is crazy. Like, this is, like, how is this even being allowed to happen right now? I let her know, like, girl, fuck with these people. Think you have people out here who actually love you, who you're actually touching every single day. Rico tried to keep in mind that her community had her back. But it was getting hard, because even though she knew she had fans out there in the crowd each night, they were getting drowned out by Cardi's, and that made the hate feel even louder. Two nights later, the tour bus rolled into Portland. My little sister, the day of the concert was her birthday, so I was like, yo, I have an idea for your birthday. Talile, that fan from the beginning of the episode, was excited to celebrate their sister's birthday by going to see one of their favorite artists. At the same time, though, they were nervous. I would seen on, like, Social media, especially on TikTok, that there were videos of um, Playboy Cardi fans is what it looked like, um, like kind of like booing her off stage, just having this animosity for her for no, no reason. And I kind of thought like, this is not, I hope that this is not how Portland is going to show up and show out for Rico. But Talila knew how Portland could be. This city, people call it like a liberal safe haven type of a vibe, but it is definitely for white individuals to have this, I don't know, like white savior like aspect, like white women wearing shirts, like protect black women in, in Portland. And then they'll come to my job and they'll yell at me. <laughs> they have all the face of it. Like, I'm woke, I'm liberal. But when it comes down to, to actually seeing a black person in person, they are shocked afraid like you can tell just by looking at their face like they are uncomfortable with you being there regardless they weren't gonna let all that noise get in the way of their good time the night of the show she got ready with friends before we went to the show we we got our outfits together we tried to go for something something punk we tried to go for something that Rika would like we were listening to her songs and we were dancing in the mirror and you know we were so excited when they all got to the venue, though, things felt off. There were, like, large crowds of white boys, probably between the ages of, like, 14 to freshmen in college, and they were all just kind of, like, had this, like, hype mentality. There were so few of us Black women there. There were some, and we did make friends with a few people, too. But the vibe was uncomfortable. The lights went down. Enrico's set was about to start. When the music started and that tension got thicker and thicker, I was like, this is this is insane. I got on stage and I was just performing. I was performing like regular, bro. It was just a regular show. People were singing. It was mosh pits. It was fun. It was lit. I was bouncing around. I was jumping up and down. And I had seen, like, in this corner, it was just niggas. And they wasn't dancing. And they wasn't doing nothing. They was just looking at me. And they made me like a foot away from the stage. Like, it's three rows of people in front of them. Cool. And they was white. Mm -hmm. The people that I'm talking about, I keep saying niggas, but they was white. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. But, mm -hmm. I was up out of my seat. My sister was up out of her seat. All, all these black women. And then rows and rows behind us, people are just sitting. All the rows in front of us, people are just sitting. You can tell it's like they're bored. They're kind of like, just get over this kind of energy. As Talile watched from her section, that crowd went from being bored to straight up disrespectful. Talile pulled out their phone and started recording. They were chanting Cardi. They were saying, get off the stage, trying to cut her step short and then just move on. And they kept doing it. Like, you know, what the fuck is going on? Like, you could hear like this rumble. The people who are fans of hers are waiting for the next lyric, next beat. Like, we're all kind of like, what, what's going on? You could tell something happened. Someone threw something at her. We had no idea what it was from our angle. And then a bottle like hit me in my arm. And I looked up. She was looking at the crowd and she starts pointing. <laughs> the 
this is gonna sound so psych, like wild of me, and it was wild of me to think like this, but I just had thought it came from right where I had seen them. So I just said, who the fuck did that? And they start pointing. And as they pointing, the niggas is running. You could tell she's she's about to fight this person. So I'm, I jumped off the stage. She just played like four songs about fighting somebody. And I don't know why you would throw something at her. And I grabbed the pers person that I seen. And I, I hit them. And then they were a fan. You're a fan? Yeah. And that's when I knew that I can't really do anything. You could see her the whole security team like surrounding her, like trying to get her. Like, it was like, you know, men in, in black uniforms just just trying to salvage the situation. Security grabbed me. He folded my ass like a chair. You can see it in the video. He folded me. He got my ass quick as hell. And then I just like walked off and I was like, what the fuck did I just do? Like, what the fuck? Like, why did I do that? Why the fuck did I just do that? Why the fuck didn't I just say something funny or like make light of it? It wasn't even a big bottle. Like, why did I do that? Why did I stop the show? I just was so mad at myself. My heart like broke for her. I was sad, I was hurt, I was upset. I was mad that why would someone do that? Everybody was trying to figure out what happened. And then the internet was like blowing that shit crazy. And then everybody was calling me like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, nothing. Um, Just a crazy show. It was one of the hardest shows I think I've had to go to because of that energy in the room. It was one of the most hostile shows I think I've ever been to. It's not an energy I want to be in ever again or space I want to be in ever again. The other girls with me are a genuine fan of hers. Like we want to see her succeed and we want to see her have a successful concert, but all these people are out here ruining it for us. She's worked hard, she's earned her place and she deserves a seat at the table. This doesn't make any sense. We were just kind of like, so, so, so drained. Talile posted a TikTok of what happened that night. Once they got home, all they wanted to do was put their phone to charge and go to bed. <whistles> By the time she woke up, her TikTok was part of a much larger conversation. One that was gonna clock what went down that night as more than just fleeting controversy. Rico jumping off that stage in Portland ignited a storm online. It spread from TikTok to Instagram to Twitter. Never disrespect the crowd. She has a lot to learn. I feel so bad for Rico. Rico sucks, though. Not bad. Y'all spent a year inside and forgot how to act in public. Booing her for Sick what? Sick and racist and misogynistic. Even there, nobody wants to Bruh. hear that beat. They're making Cardi look like a queen. She's a fucking queen. They love to hate on black women, for real. There was one person watching this go down that knew it went a lot deeper than this internet chatter. I start to see these videos that literally are like, you know, maybe like six or seven or eight hours old. This is Musani Musa, internet commentator and the creator of Culture Unfiltered, a hub for pop culture and music discussions, especially hip hop. I saw like all of these bad things happening to Rico Nasty and it was video after video after video. It was kind of shocking. The crowd was just disrespectful, inconsiderate, immature, and just lacking in couth. Seeing all this, Masani was angry for Rico. Rico Nasty is an artist who has worked her behind off to be in this space, performing, you know, her art. And it came off as anti-Black woman because it's like they're not even giving her a chance to perform it. And I just thought that was extremely wrong. I just knew, like, you know, deep down in my soul as a Black woman, like, she did not deserve that treatment. And I think in situations like that, it's important to speak up and speak out about it. So she did. So over the weekend, Rico Nasty called Playboy Cardi fans anti-Black because they were disrespecting her as she was opening for him. I think this situation makes it obvious that, yes, alternative hip-hop realm of music can be very anti-Black and isn't welcoming to Black women. Let me know what y'all think about this. Masani's reaction video circulated all over. TikTok, YouTube, and Twitter. 
a lot of the responses that I got were like Playboy Cardi fans. I call them the Playboy Cardi Hive. A lot of those comments, I didn't even give energy to because that same audience that was disrespecting her, you know, was the same audience that was showing up in my comment section. And I feel like for some people, unless you put yourself in a black woman's shoes, you will never understand, you know, where we're coming from. And I think that audience is dedicated to misunderstanding black women as a whole. I stood 10 toes down on what I said. Trolls weren't the only ones in our comments though. Some people were curious about how a white Playboy Cardi fan coming to a Playboy Cardi concert and booing Rico Nasty would be deemed anti-blackness if Playboy Cardi is black himself. That opened the conversation for how you can fetishize a single black person and still be considered anti-black, and especially anti-black woman. That's the main reason her video went so viral because Masani was one of the first people with a platform to call out Rico's experiences, what Cardi's fandom was doing to her as misogynistic. How are these instances of casual sexism, how does it relate to the inherent misogyny of hip hop? I think that has been a thing since the beginning of hip hop, unfortunately. And hip hop being an art form, being a culture that everybody has contributed to, um, in a perfect world, black women would get celebrated for their contributions just as much as black men, but they don't. Instead of celebration, it's a fight for the most basic forms of respect. As a woman in the game, Rico knows this too. This pattern pops up all the time, like with JT from City Girls, who was clown when she got arrested for scamming, just as City Girls was on the rise. And people thinking that shit is funny. Yeah, yeah. And like, There's nothing funny about that. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Megan. There's nothing funny about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, what does that say about... It say that they don't care. That's why we have to care about ourselves. That's why they so mad that we pop our pussies and we pop our shit. Because who else will? Y'all not going to pop our shit. Y'all not going to tell us that we the baddest bitch. Y'all just going to keep breaking us down. Who is going to tell us we're the baddest bitch? We have to tell ourselves. We have to. And that's why you get the music that you get. This confident, cocky ass shit that the niggas can't stand. They hate it. Hate it. It's not for you. It's not for you, bro. <laughs> Rico's music and attitude specifically not being for the bros. It's what built Nasty Mob up. But it's also what created this clash on tour. Every time Rico got back up on that stage and was defiant, it became like a challenge for this segment of Cardi fans to shut her down. The tour rolled through Seattle, Vancouver, Salt Lake City. And each time Rico went up, she felt this pressure building. Even though she was downplaying it, she started to feel unsure of herself. Like she didn't know how the crowd was going to react to her. I was already trying to, like, make light of what had just happened. So I'm, like, trading lightly as it is. In mid-November, the tour stopped in Morrison, Colorado. This is at fucking Red Rocks, which is one of the best venues ever. Yeah, Red Rocks is pretty iconic. It looks almost like the stage was dropped right in the middle of the Grand Canyon. And for some artists, it's like a bucket list type of show. But it was far from that for Rico. If anything, this show made things worse. They fucked my sound. The speakers blew out and the crowd started booing again. And then... This one was more fun. It was a glass bottle this time. I had on my moon boots, so like it just hit the front of my boot. I just was on the mic. I was like, what are y'all so mad for? And I remember turning around and my manager grabbed me and I'm like, let me go. Like, I don't give a fuck. And then my other tour manager is like, give me the mic. So I took the mic and I smiled at the nigga that did sound like, fuck you, basically. Like, you're a bitch ass nigga. And then I took the mic and I threw it as far in the air as I could. And I remember when it came down, it made the craziest sound. On the cement? On the cement. It completely, like, shattered. And they had to, like, get a new mic and do all this shit. And I didn't give a fuck because I don't care. Like, what? 
Y'all want to break shit? I want to break shit, too. We could break shit all night. Rico's set ended. But later that night, during Playboy Cardi's set, Cardi brought Rico back out. He picked her up and hugged her. And then, as he performed his song, Sky, Rico stayed on stage and hopped around in the smoke with him. Now there's a weird sense of irony in this moment. Because from the video, the crowd actually looks hyped to see Rico. This is the same crowd that was just booing her a few minutes earlier. Remember how our producer Mono described Cardi fans as being rebellious for rebellion's sake? This little recording sums that up completely to me. The crowd is so worked up by Cardi, they don't really care about anything else. Especially not that Rico is the person they were just heckling. In this moment, it becomes so clear that to them, rebelling against the opener, messing with Rico, it's just something to do. Behind the ego and audacity of monopolizing a space meant to be shared, they're really just oblivious. What a privilege to be so absent-minded in the damage you cause. And as for Cardi, I'm not gonna lie, the hug was nice. But after weeks of harassment by Cardi's fans, it did not make things any safer for Rico. Or fans like Talile who felt uneasy in the crowd. In fact, it downplays what just happened and it sidesteps the impact. You could definitely tell it was because of racism. It was because of misogyny, misogynoir, obviously. Like, that's exactly what was going on. And now when I, like, enter a concert space, I'm trying to imagine the kind of group that'll go there and if I'm even comfortable being there at all, um, regardless of if I'm a fan of their music, because it's like, I think not understanding that two artists have different fan bases puts a clash definitely and the fact that he couldn't even stand up for her you know by hugging her on stage that's one thing we understand like but it's like you need to say some words too these people were saying some words to her as of this recording we reached out to cardi's camp multiple times for comment on this story and have yet to get a response a week after red rocks rico shared that it was becoming too much we had someone read her tweets again. I dead ass need at least two hours out of each day to just cry. Crazy how I wanted a tour bus my whole life, and now I just be on the tour bus, crying myself to sleep every night. Y'all win. I wish I was dead just as much as y'all do. Trust me. Rico later deleted this series of tweets, but Red Rocks was only the halfway point of the tour. With more than 20 stops to go, the end felt really far away, and Rico's team was worried for her. After the glass bottle, they were like, girl, get the fuck off this tour. You got to get off this tour. And I was just like, eh, I could. I could get off the tour, right? And then, like, all those little geeky, nerdy, slutty boys, they'll be like, yes, we succeeded. We did it. We got her to leave. I cannot give them that satisfaction. Mm. Go pile up those fucking wet socks in your corner, nigga. Like, I don't care. I'm not oh giving God. you that satisfaction. I'm not going to go nowhere. Go do something. Go build a house. And just, like, Playboy Cardi and Ken Carson, them just making, always making light of the situation. Like, always seeing me be like, oh, like, what the fuck? And then just being like, girl, you're the best. Shut up. Like, fuck them niggas. <laughs> Who gives a fuck? But you talk about making light of the situation, and some of your fans felt threatened, and, like, you had a bottle thrown at you. But... <sighs> but it's like, in retrospect, like, I'm supposed to just quit. I'm on one of the biggest tours of the year. And I don't give a fuck about no damn bottle. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I don't care. Everybody was like, pull off, pull off, pull off. And I was like, no. They was like, do you want them to hit you? Do you want someone to finally hit you? Do you want someone to hurt you? It's like, no. But if they do, it'll be an even better story to tell. Who gives a fuck? I'm not here for the pretty shit. I'm not here for the cute shit. I'm here to make a fucking difference. I'm here for the people who go right into the motherfucking flames and get burned. Like, I don't give a fuck. 
fight me. Ain't nobody fight me. Ain't nobody jump up on the stage and tackle me. God forbid that any of this ever happens. Like, it's so crazy. I even have to say that because shit like that does happen to people. And it's scary. Like, I could just be enjoying myself and somebody just hurt me. Yes, it's terrifying. But 10 years from now, when that shit happens to another girl, she won't feel alone. And she won't feel like she need to give up either. I don't care about being safe. Like, I care about people understanding that you can do what the fuck you want, whether or not they like you. You you got to be strong in life, not even just in music. Like, you got to be strong in life. You have to. You have to. Being strong in life can get you through a lot. But sometimes, strength gets used against you. Weaponized to justify hurting you even deeper. Because you can take it, right? Her staying on the tour and dealing with that treatment was an example of the strong Black woman trope. That's Masani Musa again. People buy into the fact that Black women possess less emotions than everybody else, that they can handle the harassment, they can handle, um, you know, the name calling um, without really thinking about how it would affect the actual person. I think it points to the dehumanization of Black women. A Black woman's existence, if she is in the mix of any type of drama or anything else, is like comedy, it's like entertainment. Entertainment and rationale to disregard Black women's pain and ultimately flatten us into caricatures. A savior like Stacey Abrams or a martyr like Toen Salau. A scapegoat like Janet Jackson or a spectacle like Megan Thee Stallion. The Strong Black Women label is packaged and sold as a compliment, and it's been internalized by many Black women as such for a long time. But really, it's an insult for even being asked to withstand all this in the first place, and to do it alone. It stems from survival, and I think that can be attributed back to how we had to survive emotionally, physically, and mentally during slavery. You know, we weren't seen as women, we were seen as black women, thus being able to take the abuse, you know, take the harassment, um, and all the other unsavory things that women in slavery had to deal with, and just keep it trucking. Along with being too loud and too angry, it's one of the most pervasive stereotypes in America about black women. I think a lot of black women may have to deal with that in private, but Rico Nasty was dealing with it in public with, you know, the whole world watching. I don't blame her for sticking it out. Also, at the same time, I don't think black women should be conditioned to feel like we have to stick things out. When I talked to Rico about all this, it was clear that she was holding on to strength as her coping mechanism to stick things out, and to survive tour. But I wanted to go deeper than that. I want to go back to something you just said about not quitting and not dropping off the bill despite all this shit happening to you. I think that's something very within your character, very within a lot of Black people, a lot of Black women. Mm -hmm. But my line of questioning is more about why does it have to be that way? Why, like why do I have to be the guinea pig? Why do why do why, why do black have women have to be the strongest, most resilient, put up with anything, sacrificial type of people? Oh my for, gosh! You know what I'm saying? Why we got to be so tough? Why does it have to happen in the first place? Because we get the short end of the stick. We just do, and you're either gonna be victim, or you're just gonna be a fucking warrior, like bro, like. I just feel like I spent a lot of time feeling like that. Feeling like, why me? Why I gotta be strong? Why I gotta fucking do this? Why? Why? Mm -hmm. Why do I always have to keep a safe face? And why? And then it's just like, because you do. Unfortunately. It's just crazy, bro. Niggas don't have no respect. They don't give a fuck about us. And I'm not going to go blue in the face trying to prove people to love us and care about us. I'm just going to love us. I'm going to care about us. Mm. I'm going to do it. 
and I'm just one person, but I'm all I can be in control of. You know what I mean? Like, I can preach the good word till I'm blue in the face. Respect women, but niggas just don't. They don't give a fuck about us. Like, and it makes me want to cry saying that crazy statement because I know people going to hear it and be like, that's crazy to say because we do. But it don't feel like y'all do. So until it feel like y'all do, I'm going to love us. Rico's love and commitment to being strong for her community is real. On this tour, it was also lonely and exhausting. It was going to take a whole new environment with whole new energy for her to feel that love back. It's a year after Cardi's tour, and Rico's back on the road again. This time as a supporting act on Kehlani's Blue Water Road tour. And Talile's back too, at the same venue where that first bottle was thrown at Rico in Portland. I'm glad that she decided to come back. Talile was worried Rico wouldn't come back. But this tour has very different energy to it. With Kehlani as the headliner, it's much more queer, much more black, and just more inviting. When this show was announced, Talile jumped on the tickets with her friend. She's a Kalani fan. We kind of made our outfits. I was dressing for Rico, and she's dressing for Kalani. Our producer, Sam J. Leeds, meets up with Talile by will call. Talile walks up in a black crop top, red bootleg pants with cutouts at the hip, bold eyeliner, and of course, some Doc Martens. So how does it feel to be back knowing you're going to see Rico? I I, my adrenaline is like pumping. <laughs> I am so nervous and so excited. Um, she's iconic. But before Talila and Sam head to the mosh pits, Sam has a surprise. Oh, uh, okay, so mm -hmm. tonight, mm -hmm. we have organized the opportunity for you to meet Rico. Oh, shit, okay. <laughs> How are you feeling? Um, I'm nervous, um, I'm sweaty. Uh, <laughs> I still hope she likes me <laughs> besides those two facts. Um, oh my God, okay. Sam and Talile start walking to meet up with Rico's tour manager. My jaw is to the floor <laughs> um, and I'm shaking. So, yep, yep, I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'm ready, let's do this. Some deep breath. <sighs> She's just a regular person with talented talents, okay. <sighs> well, I'm bringing her in like two minutes. All right, well, hang tight, thank you. Backstage, they're in the cafeteria space that all arenas seem to have for the people who work there at the venue. Tables, tile floors, empty buffet stations, and these vinyl booths up against one of the walls. So maybe I should sit in the booth, but will she sit in the booth? <laughs> we can have her like sit here, maybe. Oh, Oh, yeah, like With we're that. just two old friends yeah, catching, just catching up. up. <laughs> no. Okay. Casual. As Salile plops down into one of the booths, she talks about how she just got off work a few hours ago and on the car ride home listened to Smack a Bitch, the same song that first put them on to Rico. This song really hits after work. And right as they're saying that, oh my gosh, Rico strolls in. Oh hello. my god, hello. Here you go. Hi. Blunt in hand. Oh my god, your outfit is beautiful. Thank you. Rocking a red wig, black leather jacket, mini skirt, and a trucker hat. Rico slides into the booth right next to Talile. How do you feel like right before your, your big concert? Second time. I don't know. I was really nervous. I was like, how am I gonna... You're Rico fucking nasty. What? Come on. Well, I mean, you're a person too, but like, yeah. you know. They start to talk about the last time they were both here, what they both went through. Yeah, and I feel like the last tour was weird, so. Oh, yeah, I got that vibe too. I didn't, it didn't come for Cardi, so I was just like, I came for you, I just that came. That sucks. Yeah, yeah. This shit is kind of like terrifying. For you, like being in the middle, like hearing them, because I know at Red Rocks, yeah. they was, it was like a crowd full of white people. 
and I heard they was calling me nigga bitch. They was calling me nigga. They was calling me all types of shit. So I always wondered, like, bro, is it like my black girl fans in the fucking crowd listening to niggas be like that? And the crowd is like, I want, cause you can't, yeah. you a woman and it's all white men around you and you black, bro, you can't say nothing, bro. You really yeah. can't say nothing. It shit is just exhausting. Like, okay, so keep going. Uh, before the concert even started, these girls were just sitting down and they, these white boys like kicked them out of their seats, even though they bought those seats. Like they started making up shit like, oh, those are fake tickets. And then the girls tried to get security. Well, the girls were thinking of getting security, but they didn't want to be snitches. And I was like, no, no, I'll do it. If you want me to do it, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. It's like, oh, we don't want to be snitches. Ladies, like, yeah. ladies, be snitches, be bitches. <laughs> Fuck these niggas. We don't trust these niggas. We don't, definitely don't love these niggas. We don't have sympathy for these niggas. These weak ass niggas. Get these niggas in trouble. Get these niggas in the fuck trouble. Do you fucking hear me? I just think at the end of the day, all of it is just speak up. Like for real, speak up. I didn't want to tell nobody. Tell, tell, bitch, tell. Because nobody's gonna fucking stand up for us. Like. You go in the crowds of these men that are supposed to protect us, they're not gonna protect us. Protect your fucking self. Well, I feel like you made us like black girls who dress alternatively or like feel like weirdos. Like you made us feel comfortable and safe. I feel like when all of that shit was going on, I feel like that was like stripped away from me. I felt really weak. I felt very like, like I couldn't be that for y'all. For everything that I stand for, for you guys and everything that I stand for, in this rap shit, literally for black women, it's just like, that would've been so pussy. Like, I have to do it for us and anybody coming after me. Rigo seems signal she has to get ready to get on stage. She stands up to me. Thank you. Thank you, what the hell? <laughs> Thank you, this is cool. Yeah, Hearing your perspective was... Thank you so much yeah. for yeah. Yeah, no problem. Wow, I'm sorry you had to go through it. No, I'm sorry, you were... No, I'm sorry. I had to go through it, shit. For Talila and Rigo, being able to say they got each other, it doesn't change the past. It doesn't solve everything. But it is a reminder. When the world tells us to deal with Massage Noir alone, community shows us we don't have to. Thank you. Good luck, have a great show. Break a leg, but don't. <laughs> Sam and Talila make their way back to meet up with Talila's friend in the pit. Okay, hey, it was, okay, yeah, I got to, I, you know, I got to just meet Rico. Talila and her friend break away from Sam and wade into the crowd. The lights go dark, and Rico's DJ starts to chant. When I say Rico, y'all say nasty Rico! 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 The whole pit screams for Rico and starts to bounce. Toxic shit. You gon' have to show me. You gon' have to show me. All the way you back in the stands, people are Which up out their loves. seats. You gon' have to blow me. The crowd is here for Rico. Me. You gon' have to blow me now. And Rico knows it. You gon' have to hold me. Toxic shit. You gon' have to show me. You gon' have to show me. As y'all know by now, this season is about Massage on Noir and how it holds us all back. So even the people with the most power in this culture, cis, straight men, are tangled up in it too. How has it opened your eyes to the inequality in the industry in a way that we didn't already know? The way we modeled ourselves after our oppressors in so many ways is, is just, that's the hardest nut to crack in all of this. When you start to think about how deeply ingrained it is, then you start to think about ways that you might have played a role without even being conscious of it. Next episode, we'll be doing something a little different. I'll be taking us through rule number nine and how hip hop shaped my own sense of masculinity. That's next time on Louder Than a Riot. Louder Than a Riot is hosted by me, Sydney Madden, and Ronnie Carmichael. This episode was written by myself and Sam J. Leeds, and it was produced by Sam J. Leeds. Our senior producer is Gabby Borgarelli. 
And our producers are Sam J. Leeds and Mano Sandresen. Our editor is Soraya Shockley, and our engineer is Gilly Moon. Our senior supervising producer is Cher Vincent, and our interns are Jose Sandoval, Teresa Shia, and Pilar Galvan, with help from Jerusalem Truth. And the NPR execs are Keith Jenkins, Yolanda Sanguini, and Anya Grundman. Original theme by Casa Overall, remixed by Susie Analog. And scoring for this episode was provided by Susie Analog and Casa Overall. Our digital editor is Jacob Gans. Our fact checker is Will Chase. And shout out to our social media voice actors. Alante Serene, Brianna Scott, James Sneed, Andrea Gutierrez, Juma Say, Bobby Carter, Alex Curley, and Janet Lee. If you like this episode and you want to talk back, hit us up on Twitter. We're at Louder Than a Riot. And if you want to email us, it's louder at npr.org. From NPR Music, I'm Rodney Carmichael. And I'm Sydney Madden. This is Louder Than a Riot.